I sat down to work on my sermon uh, for today. And, and it's funny because, you know, I don't know if any of you do any public speaking or have done in the past. But when you're in front of a crowd and you start talking about um, what's on your heart, whether it's a teaching or if it's, a, if it's something, in this case, where God gives you a passage and he wants you to break it down and, and share it with others. And I, I would call myself a teaching pastor. I don't think that I'm. Um, I don't think that I'm so much of a of a preacher, although maybe sometimes I'm more of a teaching pastor. I feel like I I listen and I study and and I feel like that's more what God's calling me or called me to do. And so as we as we think about those things, I I constantly am going back and looking at what we've talked about. You know, there's this thing about uh, beating a dead horse. You know. And when you, when you say the same thing over and over and over, which I think we all do as preachers because, you know, I mean, the truth is there's 66 books, you know, there's only so much. But the story is the story of God. And so the story is always, always the same, basically, but how we receive it and how we apply it might be a little bit different from day to day to day. So that's the challenge up here. And so as I was looking at these last three weeks, I felt like maybe we need to change, not really change directions, but go a little different. Um, three weeks ago, we talked about a woman being healed when she wasn't even looking to be healed. You know, she, she shows up in the synagogue and Jesus calls her over and heals her. Not only that, we also talked about a worthless fig tree. You know, being a worthless fig tree. Why we don't want to be like a worthless, worthless, worthless fig tree. Then two weeks ago, we talked about uh, what we would be willing to do. How uncomfortable we would be willing to allow ourselves to become in order to reach people for Christ. Remember that? We talked about how far will you go? Remember that email that I shared? I think uh, I'm going to exaggerate. I might have shared it like 50 times in one sermon. I exaggerated a little bit. But, you know, I, I mean, there was an email that I got that really touched me. And so I shared it with you about that. Then last week, we looked at a passage that told us to hate the ones that we love the most. Now, remember, we said that didn't really make sense. And so we look deeper into what it meant, and we saw that Jesus was really just saying, nothing can be allowed to come before God. Mm -hmm. And saying, if something comes before God, then that's the thing. We have to treat it at least as if we hate it, because it cannot come between us and our Creator. He is first, and He will not be satisfied with any other position. That's the big question. That's the big point of that, of that story. I didn't realize when I was preaching each one of those, when I was studying for each one of those messages, when I put those messages together, I didn't realize how well each of those teachings go together. And that they look a little bit further into how far God will go to connect with his creation. It never occurred to me as I was following those scriptures and as I was studying those scriptures how they fit together to show us that God is willing to go pretty much as far as he has to go to reach his creation. So, today I want to look at another passage. And it's found in Luke 15, 1 through 7. <coughs> Will you stand in honor and reverence to the Word of God. It says this, Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near him to listen to him. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. 
So he told them this parable, saying, What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I tell you that in the same way there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You can sit. Let me start off today by sharing a little bit of information you may not have known about this passage of Scripture. First of all, this is the first story from a grouping of stories that are commonly called the Gospel of the Outcast. The Gospel of the Outcast. And it's called that because, for a large part, chapters 15 through 19 are looking at how Jesus is concerned for the social outcast of his day. Now, I just started thinking about that. And I started thinking about the fact that the social outcast in Jesus' day was probably a little different than the social outcast in our day. But, if we think about how Jesus steps out, and, and you can go back those three weeks and see those things, if you start thinking about how Jesus steps out or goes farther to reach the social outcast, you can already see there's a challenge in this message. There's already a challenge saying, well, wait a minute. If Jesus went this far to reach a social outcast, is he going to ask me to do that? So right off the bat, we see there's a lost sheep. There's a lost coin. There's a lost son. There's an unrighteous steward. There's a rich man who is trying to get to Lazarus, right? Lazarus, you know, Lazarus the beggar. Not Lazarus that was raised from the tomb, but Lazarus the beggar. These are all stories in this, in this passage, this, this grouping. Then there's the ten lepers that Jesus heals, and only one comes back to say thank you. And then that all ends with the rich young ruler. A rich young ruler that says, Jesus, what, what do I have to do to inherit the kingdom of God? So you can see how these are, these are passages that are grouped together. And Luke's the only one that, that groups them together like this. So you can see through Luke, though, that he's trying to make a point. He's trying to say something with this group about the social outcast of the day. <clears throat> If you think about what that means for us today, if you think about how Jesus concerned himself, if you think about how far he was willing to go, what does it do in your spirit? What does it do for you as you think about, um, I'm a follower of Christ. I do as Christ has asked me to do. I knelt at an altar or stood in a chair or stood by a chair or sat in a chair and said, Lord, I'm a sinner. We don't like to use that word anymore. But I'm a sinner. I have sinned against you and I need you to come into my life. That's what it takes to repent. At that point, we say, God, we realize that our sin separates us from you. And so we want to turn away from that sin, repent, and receive you as Lord and Savior, right? That's what most of us have done. That's why we gather together as Christians. I, 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 tend, to, I tend to shy away from that word because Christian doesn't always mean follower of Christ these days. You know? So... That's what it takes. And this is what we're talking about. But Jesus is willing to go as far as he has to go 
to reach even one. When we read through these stories, when we see that how far he'll go, we realize that we have to be willing to go to. I guess that's really what I'm trying to say there. So I want us to look a little closer at this idea today uh, to see how we can apply it. I've shared a lot of my story with you. Uh, it shouldn't be a big surprise for most of you who have been here for a while to hear me talk about how I was before Christ. I was a lot different person. I mean, to be honest, you would not know me. I was a very, very different person. Maybe some of you were too. But like, pretty much everything that I am today is what I wasn't before Christ. So, as I'm in this pulpit and I talk about things that I have dealt with and the things that I have done, there are things about me that I probably haven't shared. One is that before Christ, I was a very manipulative person. In other words, I tried to manipulate others to help me gain where I wanted to be. Now, I was always a friendly guy. I was always pretty much... Um, I wasn't popular, but I wasn't not popular, if that makes sense. Uh, so it wasn't like I was somebody everybody wanted to be like. And it wasn't that I wanted to be like somebody. It was just that I wanted to do what I wanted to do when I wanted to do it. I know none of you were like that. So there were times when people got in the way of me going where I wanted to go and doing what I wanted to do. And so I was not really, I didn't really feel shame in it's their fault. They got in my way. You know, if I run somebody over, it's not because I'm looking to run somebody over, it was because I'm going there and they got in the way. It's their <coughs> fault. That's how I used to be. And so I didn't really concern myself with those that I offended or those I hurt on my way to my goal. You know, when I think about that, there's one story that always sticks out that has, it's truly haunted me most of my Christian life, most of my adult life, because it happened in high school. <coughs> it was my junior year in high school, oh, it was my senior year in high school, and it was the beginning of the football season, and I was a football player, and I played a defensive back position, and I had played this position for two years prior, and the first year I didn't really expect to play. We had a senior playing there. He was good. I was learning the position. I expected to just get some play time. I get that. The second year, I came to practice expecting to take that position, and the coach moved somebody else into that place. And so, for the most part that year, I also stood on the sidelines, watched somebody else play this position. So the third year, my senior year, I pretty much made it well known to everybody and anybody that if they thought they were going to get that position, I would do whatever it takes to make sure they didn't. And they were like, right, sure. No, I'm talking like I would do whatever. If I have to break your leg, you will not play that position. <laughs> now, remember, before Christ, okay? Please remember that. Well, I had this guy in my class who also was playing that position and I was the starter and he was backing me up and, and I explained to him when practice started before we ever put a pad on him, look, I know we're friends, but when we get on that football field, friends gone. There is no friends. Anybody that gets in my way to be that person, that's their problem. And lo and behold, the second game of the year, the coach started him over me. Well, it happens. He played, I think, one or two series. He didn't play very long, but he did play. And then I got in and I played the rest of the game. Come Monday morning, we or, I'm sorry, Monday after school, we put on pads. And we started practice. And I had another friend that played the line defensive tackle. That boy and I also played running back. So when I was in defense and he was on offense, he got the ball. And when he came through the line, my friend stood him up, and I took him out. 
<laughs> I'm not kidding. I took it. I, I heard it. And of course, right away, he was laying on the ground, so he didn't do anything. Right away, the coach came over screaming at me. He didn't use words that I'd use here today. <laughs> screaming at me. And I just looked at the coach and I said, nobody will start in front of me this year. And I walked away. Now, I want you to realize, first of all, that I'm just trying to make a point of who I was. That was just one spot. That was on a football field where you can actually see that. I did the same thing when it came to grades, when it came to getting the girlfriend that I wanted, when it came to getting the job I wanted. I did the same kinds of things because I didn't understand how far Jesus would go to reach his creation. And it bothers me today, even today, to stand here and tell you about what I did to Kenny. Kenny was a really good-natured guy. Kenny didn't really have any ambitions to be the starting defensive back. He was just playing football. He was just doing what he came there to do. It wasn't his fault that the coach started him. Maybe when he ran the ball through there, I should have went over and hit the coach. <laughs> Probably wouldn't have played any more that year, though, right? No. So, I would call what I was a little bit ruthless, a little bit cutthroat, a little bit underhanded. Maybe even, you know, I'm not going to go that far. But I... I I did not think about what was happening with relationships at that point. I guess the point is that at that time in my life, I didn't have much regard for other people. Does that make sense? I didn't have much regard for other people. They were there. I felt like they were there for to do what they wanted to do and help me do what I wanted to do. <laughs> so, Jesus says in the story that he left 99 to go find one. I take out the one because he's in my way. Somehow that seems to contrast each other for me. That may not even work in your mind, but for me, that just was the first thing that came to my mind. Jesus is willing to leave 99. Now, I want you to hear this too. He says that he leaves 99 in an open field to go find one. I don't want you to think that Jesus just leaves you. The open field is a safe place. Do you realize that? You guys, a lot of you are farmers. You realize that? When, when you leave your animals in an open field, Predators don't really attack in an open field. Very seldom. Predators wait until they can corner in the side of the field, out in the back of the field, right? That's when you have to worry about when you see a cow that's out by itself over by the edge of the field. If you see an animal that you are trying to keep safe, separated, and then you see some wolves or coyotes coming in. Where are they going? They're not going after the flock that's in the center of the field. They're going for the one that they can separate. So Jesus is not saying that he will leave you because you're following him and go find the one that's missing. He's saying he'll leave you in a good place. He'll still be with you. He'll still be making sure that you are safe. But he is willing to go as far as he has to go to find the one that's strayed away. <clears throat> do you know, well, I know you do, there have been multiple people tell me over the years, <coughs> I might step on somebody's toes here, I'm sorry if I do, because it's not really a spiritual thing that I'm stepping on your toes with. Um, I would not, I would not uh, apologize for stepping on your toes spiritually. Sorry. But 
I have been told multiple times over the years, you know, so and so <laughs> gave their life to Christ when they were six. They were baptized, they followed God for until they got out of school. Jesus is saying, if you're straight away, he's willing to come and get you. I believe that that six-year-old who was baptized gave their life to Christ. But I also believe that at six years old, most of them don't really understand what they've done. You have to be discipled. You have to grow in the spirit and admonition of the Lord. You have to continually fill yourself with Christ and His love and His Spirit. You have to continuously put one step, one foot in front of the other as you get closer and closer to God. When those feet quit going forward, you become stagnant. And often, they start going backwards. Often, they start going sideways. Often, those feet don't walk in the Spirit. They walk away. And as they walk away, guess what happens to their faith? It gets stagnant. It gets less. It goes south. Also not really meant as a, something to keep straight. It could be as a figment of, a, of, of speech, please. I like it in the south. Here's my thought. The more we live for Christ, the closer we walk with Christ. The more we do for Christ, the more we know Christ. The more we reach out in His name, the more we begin to speak for Christ. Do you realize that? I had a good friend who actually helped lead me to Christ. And years into the relationship, he was dealing with some things and he wasn't sure where he was going and what he was doing. And he sat on my couch one day and he said, so I follow Jesus, but my testimony is my personal testimony. I don't need to share that with anybody. It's about me, me and Jesus, and that's it. I don't have to tell anybody else about it. And I looked at him and I said, that's called a dead faith. Well, he chose to live that for a while and walked pretty far away from the faith that he once had, that he led me to. <clears throat> I will never say somebody that gave their life to Christ at six years old can't walk with God. They can. And as long as they do, they're there. They're safe. They're good. They're, they're growing. But it's just like I said last week. If you don't get involved in a study, if you don't get involved in a discipling place, you never grow into what God wants you to be. It's okay to read at home. I think it's good to read your Bible at home. It's good to pray at home. You need other people to help you connect to God. That's scriptural. That's discipleship. That's what holds us together. And that's what helps us grow and become the image of Christ. Galatians. I told you last week, the young adult groups study in Galatians. Galatians. Read it. So, I wonder if we think about these past messages and we bring those into what we're talking about with Jesus who's willing to leave 99 safe in a safe place to go find the one that's lost and bring him back. I wonder if we think about those other things like counting the cost. How uncomfortable are we willing to be? How uncomfortable are we willing to be to reach somebody else? I wonder if we start thinking about what it means to go the extra mile, to do the extra thing, to really, truly make a difference in somebody else's life, to love somebody to Jesus. I wonder how many of us have thought about that and what we do with that. Even if we had to leave 
some other safe where they are to go find these people that need Christ. I want you to know, <coughs> Kenny and I finished school as friends. We got over that <coughs> issue pretty quickly. As a matter of fact, I apologized to him just a few weeks later. You see, I have, I've told you this before, you really have to blame Barb for me being the guy that I am. <laughs> but I have this wife who was praying for me through all of that. And she prayed me into the kingdom during that football season. And at that point, I realized, wow. Wow, I can't believe that I thought that little of a friendship. Because we were friends. It's not like I didn't like the guy. We were friends. Kenny and I ended school friends. As a matter of fact, I still see him sometimes on Facebook. He'll send me a message. I don't do Facebook very often, so I see it maybe twice a year. I go there maybe four times a year. If you ever try to contact me on Facebook, you better be very patient. <laughs> this is going to take a long time before you get a reply. I've had multiple people say, man, I sent you a message on Facebook back in January. I'm like, really? I don't think I've been there since January. I don't really do a whole lot of Facebook. When I do Facebook, and I've told you this before, when Kristen calls me and says, hey, Dad, I just posted pictures of the boys. I'm on Facebook right away. You know that? That's why I have Facebook. So, Kenny sends me a message every once in a while. We're still friends. We're still uh, okay. And he knows about my faith. Because I was radically changed. There was this guy who wrote a song and did an album. And some of you are old enough to remember Carmen. But Carmen did, a, did an album called Radically Saved. And that was my story. I was that guy that was doing everything I could do to get to hell quick. I really, truly was. And what God did was he said, okay, we're going to stop that and turn you around. And so, like, I blew a lot of people's minds. Because one day, I was in class being me before Christ. And I came back after a weekend I wasn't that guy anymore. And they're like, what did you do with my friend? I said, man, I don't know how to explain it. All I can tell you is I met Jesus over the weekend. Wow, so now you're some kind of Jesus freak, religious guy? I don't even know that answer. I, I can't give you that answer. All I know is I met Jesus and I am different. Everything about me is different. It's not because, it's not because I feel like I have to make up for what I've done. It's because Jesus is living in me. And because Jesus is living in me, I just see everything different. And I want you to know, colors become vibrant. Life becomes vibrant, alive, awake. It's exciting. That's why. That's why I struggle. When I come to a church, any church, and people sit there with this frown on their face. Just go ahead and try to bless them. I struggle with that. I'm like, man, the Jesus I know is on fire. He's excited. He wants to get going. How do you sit quiet? Maybe, maybe you were all good people before you knew Jesus and you didn't understand that. Extreme change. But man, I was, it was extreme for me. And I'll never forget how much it changed my life. So when I have these guys that have been in my groups or whatever, and they tell me, yeah, you know, that whole religious thing, it just doesn't work for me anymore. I said, then you never knew it. Because if you knew it, you couldn't say it doesn't work for me anymore. Because when, it, when you know it, it doesn't go away. And when you walk away, which I did, when you walk away, you instantly, instantly, you know something's missing in your life. And that's every day for me now. Every day when I find something that's getting between me and God, every day I say, whoa, i got to stop and figure this out because I don't want to lose even a little bit of the excitement I have for following Him. 
And that's what makes me walk away from the 99 that are safe in the field so that I can go and share what God's doing in my life with somebody that needs to know Him. I wonder where you are. And I'm not, I'm not in any way judging you, but I wonder where you are. If you're in a place where you understand the excitement of Christ, are you sharing it? If you're in a place where you're not sure about the excitement of Christ, what's between you and God? Remember, nothing can come between you and God. Hate that thing that comes between you and God. What is stopping you from counting the cost, from getting uncomfortable to reach Jesus, to reach others for Jesus? I guess that's where I want to leave you today. I want you to think, what does it take for you to get excited about serving Christ? Are you willing to say, here am I, Lord, send me? Because see, on the day that I did that, on the day that I said, here am I, send me, even though at that point I was walking with Christ, even more things changed. You know what I found since then? Every day when I say, God, I'm yours, something changes. Every day when I say, God, will you give me somebody to share the gospel with today? He brings somebody into my life. That's kind of strange for me. I got to tell you, back when I was working in a, in a secular job, it made sense. I work at a church most of the time now. You know how many people God will send to a church, to a parsonage, to a, to a, a school, to, to a store, to a red light? You see, God's pretty, pretty good about sending you people to share the gospel with. The question is, will you share it?